Job Snyders, eh, que es ingeniero de desarrollo de NTT, donde en la parte de arquitectura y análisis de la red global de NTT. Eh, presentador en Nanog, Lacnog, Apricot y demás. Good afternoon. My name is Job Snyders. I work for NTT Communications. Uh, thank you for having me here today. It is always a pleasure to come to South America and exchange thoughts with fellow engineers, so I appreciate this opportunity to share data with you very much. Today, I would like to talk to you about how to architect robust routing policies. Many times in the past, we have shared information with each other on how to implement a specific feature, such as uh, traffic engineering or black holing, but I would like to take a step backwards and provide you with some overall guidance on how to uh, design routing policies. Um, and this presentation is composed of information uh, that I collected from my colleagues and friends, and I asked them, what makes a great routing policy a good routing policy? And this presentation is the result. All right. There we go. In this presentation, I will offer you a conceptual model and some uh, definitions how we can talk about the concepts uh, I will explain in this presentation. Uh, and I will go over some design patterns. In other words, some advice that you can keep in mind when you design your own routing policies. Let us start with the conceptual model. Every eBGP session is defined by its function, whether it's eBGP for internal BGP or IB, uh, sorry, eBGP for external BGP or iBGP for internal BGP, and the direction. So if we look at this overview, you see three routers in a row. On the left side of the overview is my personal router. And when I send an announcement to my eBGP neighbor, it passes through what we call eBGP out. And many times you will see in router configurations that that precise phrase is used to describe the routing policy uh, that is applied on the session. Uh, but this is meant as a higher level definition. When I announce to someone else via an eBGP session, it passes through a eBGP out type policy. And consequently, the announcement is received by my eBGP neighbor, and there it will pass through eBGP in. Some processing is done. It may propagate over the backbone of the uh, adjacent network uh, through first iBGP out and then iBGP in. So one man's eBGP out is another man's eBGP in. I've uh, taken Cisco IOS, Arista, Brocade, uh, uh, you name it, style configuration as an example. The place where you associate a given routing policy with a eBGP neighbor is what we call the attachment point. And the attachment point uh, is always in context of the direction. Is this policy that is applied to what you receive or is this policy applied to what you may propagate outwards. Policy itself, when I talk throughout this presentation uh, about policy, what I mean is, for instance, a route map. And on Junos, this is called a policy statement. And on Mikrotik, I forgot the word. Um, and route maps or policy statements are divided up into smaller components called terms. Uh, and I hope that these colors kind of uh, give a place to what is what. Now, let's go through each of these uh, uh, attachment points and their directions and talk a little bit about the contents that you'd normally see in such policies. So let's start here. EBGP in. What I receive 
from my neighbor. What my neighbor can announce to me can be anything. I cannot predict the future. I cannot know what my neighbor may or may not announce. And this is why I need a filter to safeguard against the potential risk that my neighbor represents. And I call this uh, two-phase filtering. Phase one is that you discard any announcements where you immediately know that you will never want to accept them. Uh, think of uh, things like bogan uh, prefixes or private IP space. And then phase two is that you intersect between what passed through the first filter and what is on the whitelist. And then the result is perhaps eligible for a BGB best path selection. Uh, in other words, in the first phase, we throw away everything we know for sure is bad. Then uh, we scrub the list through an allow list or a white list. And what remains is uh, perhaps of interest. Let's go through this uh, step by step. The raw input in this diagram is what our neighbor is sending. And as I mentioned before, we cannot know what our neighbor will send. So this can contain anything. In IETF or RFC speak, this is called adjacent RIP in or adjacent routing information base in. And this piece of the chain is very interesting because this is where maximum prefix limits can be applied. Let's zoom in on uh, maximum prefix limits a little bit because I may be able to surprise some of you. Maximum prefix limits are a design feature to safeguard against unexpected behavior of the network. We, uh, under normal operating circumstances, we may not expect more than a few hundred prefixes from a given eBGP neighbor. So the moment we receive, say, 100,000 prefixes, we don't need to investigate what is wrong. We just know something is wrong. So in a way, maximum prefix limits are a very dumb feature, but it's a very efficient way to safeguard your network against unexpected uh, behavior. Uh, these Wikipedia links are very interesting, uh, specifically control theory. There's, there's a lot of uh, documentation available about why mechanisms like this even though they look so simple, are so effective. What happens during a route leak? And, and let's go through it step by step. On the x-axis, the bottom, we have time. From left to right is uh, into the future. And then from uh, bottom to top, we have a rising amount of BGP announcements that is being announced over the eBGP session. And what we normally expect from equipment is that as the number rises, at some point you hit the threshold where I configured this is the maximum prefix limit, and we then expect the session to be torn down. And the moment the session is torn down, both of us are safe. Because your announcements can no longer negatively affect my network, and your network is also protected, because I will no longer be sending traffic for prefixes you may uh, not want to carry traffic through. So maximum prefix limits really benefit both sides of the eBGP session. And this is how we think a lot of this works. But it turns out uh, that on many implementations, the behavior is slightly different. Again, from left to right, we have time. As time progresses, more and more uh, announcements are sent to the eBGP session. And now what happens is you have the steady state, the lower layer, which is the normal announcements. Then on top of that, there is a uh, number of invalid announcements. Invalid means in this context that even though they pass through the filter, they are still not desirable. So no filter is perfect. The second layer is the announcements that pass through the imperfect filter. Then above that is a maximum prefix threshold. And way above that is the total number of uh, route announcements uh, that came via this leak. And it is very interesting to note that in this scenario, because the filter 
is perfect, uh, imperfect, uh, and the totality of announcements is below the threshold, the session actually did not tire down, even though there was a route leak. And this happens because the policy was applied, the limit was applied after the routing policy did its filtering. In other words, if your prefix limit is applied before the routing policy is applied, you have a very effective mechanism against route leaks. If the prefix limit is applied after the filtering is done, you may end up in a situation where the leak persists and the, fil uh, the limits are never hit. So let's compare pre-policy prefix limits and post-policy prefix limits. The pre-policy prefix limits are designed against predominantly uh, two problems. One is memory exhaustion. As I mentioned before, an eBGP neighbor can announce anything in any quantity. We cannot know this ahead of time. Um, so to protect our uh, memory, the maximum prefix limit is useful. And the second most popular reason is that this guards against route leaks. The post policy limits also have a function, but that function is somewhat uh, more limited in usefulness, in my opinion, in context of internet routing, uh, because it protects against uh, local RIP and FIP exhaustion. But route leaks are, I think, a bigger problem. So I've made a small comparison uh, between various vendors and it should be uh, of note that iOS XR and iOS XE apply the, uh, the prefix limits after the routing policy is applied. And this means that prefix limits on iOS XR and iOS XE are far less effective against route leaks compared to, for instance, Junos, uh, Nokia, or BERT. Uh, you can download the slides from the website later on and it will be easier to read uh, exactly what the commands are to enable either pre or post policy uh, prefix limits. So my call to any Cisco employees in this room, please implement uh, the maximum prefix limit in such a way that it is applied pre policy rather than post policy. The internet thanks you. Another thing that does not really exist today, but that I wanted to highlight as a potential safeguard uh, somewhere in the future, is maximum outbound prefix limits. As NTT, we know that towards our peering partners, we should never announce more than, say, 500,000 prefixes. If for whatever reason we announce more than 500,000 prefixes to peering partners, or more than a million prefixes towards customers, something somewhere is wrong, and it may be in the best interest of both NTT and uh, the eBGP neighbor to just tear down the session and have human operators do an investigation what went wrong. So in other words, a self-destruct mechanism if uh, you start announcing more than you think you should be. Only the open source BGP implementation, BERT, has support for this feature, but I hope that over time we can uh, see more implementations of this concept uh, also in uh, things like Mikrotech or Bur uh, Cisco or Juniper. Now, we covered the raw input components, the, the, the type of data that we can receive from the neighbor and that uh, we, we are slowly mangling through this filtering pipeline. Right off the bat, we can allow uh, uh, block all kinds of uh, uh, bad announcements. And in this context, think about bogan prefixes or announcements that contain a bogan ASN anywhere in the AS path or uh, the more specifics of the peering LAN of IXPs. If you're connected to IXBR and the peering LAN is, say, a slash 22, you never want to see a more specific for that peering LAN uh, because if you receive a slash 23 or a slash 24, it may negatively affect uh, your routing decisions. And in the same category is RPKI invalid announcements. In the coming months, we'll see more and more companies deploy 
invalid is reject policies, and this means uh, um, uh, a significant improvement for internet security. Um, as a study resource, there is the BGP filter guide.nlnoc.net uh, that has many examples for many operating systems on how to configure this type of filter. Uh, and if you have contributions to that specific website, uh, you can edit it on GitHub or send me an email and I will incorporate your suggestions. It's run sort of as a wiki page. And then last but not least, the intersection between what passed through the bad filter uh, and what was created as a whitelist is what we eventually consider candidates for installation in our local RIP. Uh, there is uh, a lot of material on the internet on how to generate whitelists, so I'll not uh, delve into that today. But follow these links and that can perhaps uh, give you some inspiration. All right. Now that we've done all that, we've got eBGP in covered in terms of uh, uh, filters. Uh, now what? When in doubt, always use BGP communities. No matter what your problem is, BGP communities is the solutions. Trust me. So what is a BGP community? And I'll be honest with you, I don't like the name community because for me as a non-English, uh, non-native English speaker, I have very different associations with the word community uh, than I would have with the word label or classifier or marker or you know, there's a lot of words that could have been chosen better than the word community, but this is what we have today and this will never change. So a community is a group of internet destinations that have something in common. And what they have in common, that's up to you as the network operator to, to decide on. BGP communities are usually used in two steps. There's the classification step, and the execution step. In the classification step, the trick is that you associate uh, BGP communities with a given prefix that help you run your network. And common classifiers are, for instance, the route was learned from a customer, the route was learned in Mexico, the route uh, was learned from a transit provider, you name it. What classifiers you use, that is up to you. Uh, but there's, there's uh, some examples in the study resource, RC8195, uh, that can give you an idea of what classifiers are commonly useful. So if you have classified an uh, announcement, then the second step is to make use of those BGP communities. Uh, and execution, the execution step, common things that happen there is, for instance, uh, traffic engineering features such as prepend this announcement once or twice or do not announce this or only announce it to this specific eBHP neighbor, uh, you name it. There's many variants. The conceptual thing to keep in mind is that classifying and executing are two distinct steps in the routing policy architecture. So let's look at the life of a BGP announcement as it flows through eBGP out, eBGP in, iBGP out, iBGP in. AS15562, my personal ASN, announces a prefix to its upstream provider, NTT2914. The routing policy at eBGP in, so this is on NTT side, will not reject the announcement because it's not a bogan and it's part of the whitelist. Then still inside this eBGP in construct, the community classification happens. So NTT adds that it's a customer route, that it was learned in Europe, uh, and that it was learned in the Netherlands. Then still inside the eBGP in routing policy, you can offer additional features such as black holing, uh, certain traffic engineering types, um, and then the route will propagate to other routers through uh, iBHP out. On uh, the far side router, so for instance, the South American routers, 
The route announcement is received on what we refer to as IBGP in. This attachment point offers yet another opportunity to complete certain traffic engineering features, such as uh, selective black holing, um, or, or traffic engineering for any casters where you geographically uh, limit the scope of propagation. Uh, it goes into the local RIP, and it then passes through eBHP out where the final execution steps will happen based on communities. Now let's zoom in on the uh, classifier execution matrix. If I learn a route from a customer, I will want to announce that route to my other customers, my peering partners, and my upstreams. So this is the top row. On the left side, you see classifier learned from customer, and then the outcomes uh, towards each distinct uh, group are accept, accept, accept. Now, if I learn a route from a peering partner via an internet exchange, I want to announce those routes to my customers, but not to my peering partners. Because if I take routes from peering partners and announce them to peering partners, I am passing traffic without the opportunity to receive revenue for forwarding that traffic. So in the eBHP out policy towards peering partners, you will deny routes learned from other peering partners. The same for upstreams. If I learn a route from an upstream, I do want to propagate those routes to my customers. I do not want to propagate those upstream routes to my peering partners and other upstream providers. And now comes the interesting tidbit. If there is no community assigned to the route announcement, never ever propagate it. So if there is no classifier, if there is no BGP community that explicitly instructs the network, this is where you need to propagate routes, the route should not pass through eBGP out. So without classifier, without a BGP community that allows an announcement to pass through the eBGP out policy, it should be denied. This is an incredible powerful safety device. Because what if you connect a BGP speaker to your backbone and you forgot to uh, associate a uh, policy with that neighbor? And perhaps that device is a uh, DDoS mitigation device or a traffic optimizer, and it may not associate BGP communities uh, with those announcements. You never want such announcements to accidentally escape your administrative domain. In fact, if there is no BGP community associated with a route, we have no knowledge what should happen with the propagation of that route, and therefore the safest thing we can do is to not propagate it. Um, and as your network grows, this approach, using BGP communities, will save you a lot of time and effort. Because if you only use prefix lists, you'll need to update every prefix list on every router you have every time a customer adds a prefix. If you use BGP communities, you only need to update the prefix list filter on the device to which the, the customer is connected. And then based on BGP communities, the propagation will be orchestrated through the rest of the network. So BGP communities are both a safety device, a time-saving uh, 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 method. Um, they are beautiful. All right. So rejecting routes in the eBGP out uh, policy, if they don't have the appropriate BGP community, is called robust termination of the routing policy. It's a deny all at the end of your policies rather than a allow all. And fill closed in uh, engineering is considered uh, a better approach if you want to prioritize safety over other things. Now that we covered some of the uh, policy aspects, I want to highlight a few hints that in general are useful when doing network engineering. Avoid using regular expressions where possible. If you look at this beast of a regular expression, 
Is that a curse uttered in a comic book or is it a legitimate part of my routing policy? You tell me. If you use regular expressions, even though the configuration becomes a bit shorter, they are often very hard to explain to your colleagues or to explain to yourself at 3 a.m. in the morning when you're debugging your network. So avoid them where possible because it invariably uh, results in a suboptimal experience when you're trying to understand what your policy is doing. And this applies to BGP communities specifically and AS paths and what, everywhere where you can use uh, regular expressions. Another hint I have is that you write separate policies for v4 and IPv6. Even though uh, it is technically possible to announce v4 routes over a v6 BGP session, uh, even though uh, some operating systems allow mixed prefix lists uh, for v4 and v6 that you can apply uh, in context, uh, it's just like warm mayonnaise and Jägermeister, or in Argentina you would say uh, Fernet. Fernet? Fernet. Uh, it does not taste well if you mix them together. So for everything you do, set up separate BGP sessions for v4 and v6. Use separate defined routing policies for v4 and v6. Use separate prefix lists for v4 and v6. This will greatly uh, simplify your provisioning and your debugging process. Another aspect uh, I wanted to highlight, and this is mostly written from the perspective of a transit provider, uh, but there uh, may be some interest for a CDNs and uh, uh, access providers as well. I want to give you a sense of how many different policies should you have in your network if you structure your network in a similar way as NTTS structured. In general, per ASN, there will be one unique copy of the eBGP in uh, policy uh, that you can uh, uh, copy paste across your devices. But eBGP out is usually shared across customers, but a different eBGP out policy is used for peering partners or upstream providers. Uh, IBGP out is usually the same across uh, the entire uh, network, but IBGP in is usually the, uh, 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 the same per device. So, phrased differently, IBGP in we need to generate per neighbor. So for every neighbor we have, we have a unique IBGP in policy because every neighbor has its own unique prefix whitelist. So they cannot easily be shared amongst multiple eBGP neighbors. eBGP out is shared per class or per group of neighbors. So all customers fall within the same eBGP out policy. eBGP in is one per device, one per AVI, separate for v4, separate for v6. So the amount of devices you have in your network uh, indicates the amount of times you will see this policy. And then iBHP out, uh, there's one per AVI, one for v4, one for v6, but it usually can be copy-pasted across all devices. So this, this table could be used to compare whether you're on the right trajectory or not. Um, so we're getting closer to the end of the presentation. Something about BGP communities, specifically the construct that you see in many operating systems, set community x colon x. It turns out that many implementations, even though they use the same three phrases, set community and then the community value, it means different things. Some BGP implementations, uh, this command will mean delete all communities and add the community I specified. But on other implementations, it means delete some of the communities that are associated, associated with this route announcement and then add the community I set. But there also is a variant where set community x colon x. Um, 
only adds a community to the route announcement and does not delete anything. Um, and if you take into consideration an implementation of a mechanism called graceful shutdown, uh, then set community becomes uh, very annoying because it acts slightly different on Juniper than it acts on Cisco, than it acts on BERT or OpenBHPD. So it is better to just explicitly delete all communities you don't want to see on your network and then explicitly add the communities you do want to associate with a route announcement, the classification step. What communities should you delete? On inbound, I would only delete communities that can affect your network operations. So for instance, from a peering partner, NTT will delete everything that starts with our own ASN 2914. And uh, we strive to leave as many communities attached as possible because this helps uh, network operators if they want to make informed traffic engineering decisions somewhere down the path. So delete as few communities as you can. And in deleting the communities, this may be the only place where regular expressions are uh, useful to uh, prevent having to list thousands and thousands of communities. What communities to send to your neighbors, be it customers, be it peering partners, be it upstreams, I would ask you to send uh, at least geolocation BGP information. Where did you learn the route? Was it in this country or that city or, or that continent? Uh, that is, geolocation information is usually what is used to do uh, traffic engineering. As a rule of thumb, I would advise not to send or, uh, more than four BGP communities that you set yourself. Uh, you can put endless amounts of BHP communities on a route announcement, but the moment you send them out through eBHP out, uh, delete the communities that are not interesting to others, and just leave the geolocation communities. And then finally, publicly document what the communities mean, so that your partners or customers can uh, make informed decisions when doing traffic engineering. Final slides, uh, also related to the topic of routing policies. There is an RFC nowadays, RFC 8212, and I would like to ask each of you to ask your vendors for support for this RFC. This RFC simply defines if a BGP session comes up, but no policy was associated with the BGP session, do not exchange routes, do not send routes, do not accept routes. Uh, some of you may have had experience with Cisco IOS, where if you were not typing fast enough, the session would already come up while the routing policy was not yet associated with this neighbor. And this would uh, result in a leak, uh, both in sending and receiving side, and that's, of course, very annoying. So this RFC, it just, it's, it's basically, uh, you can summarize it in one sentence. Do not exchange routes on an eBHP session unless configured to do so. And if there's no configuration, then no routes should be exchanged. Very simple. Um, iOS XR already supports it, but iOS Classic and iOS XE do not yet support it. BERT supports it, OpenBHPD supports it, uh, Arista can support it if you enter a few commands. So Arista would definitely be a party to email for proper support for this RFC. Nokia committed to uh, support uh, uh, next year or the year after. Um, but yeah, please ask your vendor. Send emails to Microtik, ask them for this uh, safety feature because it can save uh, all of us a bit of headache. And this concludes my presentation. Uh, with this, I would like to open the floor for any questions you may have or comments, concerns. Um, if for whatever reason you don't want to go to the microphone right now, feel, feel free to send me an email. Uh, I prefer English, but if you want to email in Spanish, I will just involve my colleagues to uh, help translate. Um, so any questions for me about uh, routing policy architecture?
No questions? No hay preguntas? Bueno. Excellent. Thank you very much, John. Thank you.